So if the audio cuts out. All right, so once again, so dive in. Uh, my name is George Sanford. Uh, quick background. I uh, spent a lot of years in IT and in security for the last 15 or so, primarily on the vendor side, working with uh, NSM, that type of stuff. Everybody know what NDR and NSM are? Anybody not know? Excellent. Anybody want to ask me what NDR and NSM is? Excellent. Excellent. NDR is Network Detection Response. NSM is Network Security Monitoring. Thank you for asking. We'll get back to that. So, uh, apologies again. Um, this talk was initially intended to be presented with a co-presenter, and I'll tell you a little bit more about her. Uh, she is not here today. We were alternates, and uh, through the course of, of uh, events, was asked to present last minute, which is phenomenal. Um, really uh, appreciate, uh, besides Augusta, for the opportunity to be presenting, uh, and especially last minute. Um, but unfortunately, you don't get to see my co-presenter, and uh, she's the funny one. So apologies there. Uh, she's spending her day, unfortunately, recovering from getting her flu shot and is miserable that she's A, not here, and B, that she got the flu shot. A so. um, couple of things going in. Uh, first off, uh, we're going to be talking about a, a bunch of different things, and I want to throw out like a trigger warning in advance. We're going to be talking about uh, some trauma. We're going to be talking about uh, some pretty scary things, some imposter syndrome. And we're going to talk a little bit and a lot about fear. So apologies in advance if any of these areas are icky, if you need to leave, or if you need to talk a little bit later about things. I'm definitely here and open to that. I am not by profession a lawyer or a mental health professional. But if you can gauge the uh, experiences in your life, if you will, on the amount of money and time that you spend in those areas, I think I probably have invested a lot in both of those. And I'll tell you a little bit about those. Um, this talk, and uh, I don't know if anybody caught um, Mark's talk earlier on Taken. Anybody upstairs for that? So there may be a little bit of overlap. I caught the first couple of minutes. And honestly, when we submitted our talk and then saw the announcement, um, my co-presenter, my daughter, Naya, was just like, wow, that sounds really cool and really scary. And it's just like, yeah, definitely a little bit scarier than ours. So I didn't get a chance to catch out the whole talk. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. But there may be a little bit of overlap. So. Um, another thing I just want to acknowledge, we're going to talk a little bit about security and physical security and some of that. And I understand, and, and it's always struck me um, when you stand up in, in rooms like this and, and you know, have a little bit of a platform, I want to acknowledge that some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about, it comes from my background. And obviously, especially in physical security stuff, I'm 6'2", Caucasian male. I understand that that's not everybody's journey, not everybody's experience. And some of the things I'm going to say about my experience in this particular journey don't apply to everybody. And I want to acknowledge that right out of the gate, because not everybody's had the opportunities that I've had. And I want to make sure that I'm appreciative of those. And hopefully, the intent of this talk is to share some of this experience. Hopefully, it resonates with you, sparks some ideas. And ultimately, part of what I'm looking for here is not only feedback, but other ideas. So, because at the end of this, I still don't have great answers for everything. And I'm looking for some of those. So, okay. So, um, my co presenter, this fabulous young human being here, is my 14 year old daughter, Naya. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about Naya's background in a second after we talk a little bit about OPSEC. But um, again, Naya can't be here, but I do have her permission. This is not a uh, extension of if you include puppies and cats in your presentation, it kind of goes over well. So I am not, uh, shall we say, uh, utilizing this child to get a speaking spot. So we talked about. Um, a good extension of how do we share our experience with other people. So I have her permission to share what I'm going to share. Um, I hope you will also understand that some of the stuff I'm sharing is, again, going to be sensitive. And from an OPSEC perspective, 
Uh, this is putting ourselves out there a lot more than I typically would like to. You know, I'm on social media a little bit, I'm on LinkedIn a little bit, professional networks, but this is a little bit of exposure. So I appreciate the opportunity, but what I'm going to ask you to do is at least adhere to basic Chatham House rules. So if you want to talk about stuff, that's great. But if you have criticism, more than willing to listen to it. If you have feedback, more than willing to listen to it. Uh, parenting is always an interesting and challenging thing to talk about. So if you got feedback, please come and see me about it. But please don't put me or especially her on blast anywhere on social media. All right, and that's kind of the caveat that I'll ask you to do if you can't retain from that. So again, talk to me directly. So first rule, please don't put her on blast on this. So. All right, so a little bit of background. Uh, first thing that you're going to have to understand is philosophy of parenting. Uh, anybody ever see the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer? OK, excellent. So Bobby Fischer, uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer is a story of a chess prodigy that uh, stumbles upon chess in Washington Square Park in New York, which if you've never been is a wonderfully colorful and interesting place. There's a lot of different things going on there. And this chess prodigy's parents start doing some formal training, including training with Ben Kingsley, who is a grandmaster in chess to train the kid. And at one point, the kid said, uh, the Ben Kingsley says, hey, can you stop him from playing in Washington Square Park? Because it makes my job harder. Mom's response is, well, then your job's harder. From a philosophy of parenting, this is probably the best explanation. I come from a punk background. I come from, again, typically tend a little more towards the blue side of things and law enforcement and axiomatically good, et cetera. But I believe that properly preparing kids for the world of today and tomorrow is giving them all of the tools they need. So one of the things that Naya got probably four or five years ago was lockpicks from here. Um, constantly giving her tools in different ways and different things to prepare her for who knows what's coming down the road. Okay, So does that make our job harder? Yeah. Um, it's a little more challenging, but I think this is the only way that you can really prepare for God knows what comes down the road. So a little bit of background. Now, further background. Um, both Naya and I have been uh, consumers of uh, therapy and counseling for most of our lives. Um, both Naya and I are uh, adopted children. So not that that necessarily needs, but there are anybody that's adopted. So there are questions of grief. And there's a little bit of trauma. There's a bunch of things that you want to process there. Additionally, in those times, uh, both Naya and I have a little bit of trauma and victimization in our backgrounds and have been working through that at various points in our lives. Um, this gives us the opportunity of being, you know, adherence to therapy and mental health, skill sets and tools within there. So we have lots of good conversations and we've had to have some really icky conversations already at very young ages. Okay, so for example, uh, how, how old are most people when they have the talk? Anybody not know what I mean by the talk? All right. So most people are, you know, you're approaching adolescence somewhere within there. We had to have those talks much, much younger. So which, again, sets us up for open conversation, which I am a huge fan of, obviously. So having some of that background, having some of that skill set, we're already set to have good conversations and have some tools that make uh, those conversations a little more adult than typically you'll have with kids. So. The other thing to remember there is understanding through those processes, especially dealing with trauma, especially dealing with grief, um, you start understanding how your brain works a little bit more. And you have to kind of dive in and, and understand what drives and motivates some of your actions. We'll talk a little bit about that. So I'll take you to uh, December 22nd of last year. Um, this was probably one of the hardest professional days of my life. Uh, found out right around that time that the organization I was working for was being sold off to 
partially sold off to another organization, found out that a large percentage of our team was being riffed. Um, I lead that team, so I had to have those calls, which, again, sorry if it triggers, I know a lot of people are in that boat or have been in that boat. Uh, some of my folks are here in the room. Um, it was a really no good, horrible, nasty day. Um, and really kind of painful, and you kind of have to dive in, and it sucked. And there was a lot of unknown. So in the midst of that day, and trying to figure out what the future holds and how to take care of my people, et cetera, all through Zoom, um, I get this alert. So, and it's pretty standard. You know, it's just a, eh, hey, you've got to charge an account. What was interesting was this is uh, an account that we typically don't use on a credit card that we typically don't use. In fact, it lives in a drawer. But I did what I had to do at this point, and I put it in the drawer, and I'm like, I'll come back to it later. Went about the day, that day lasted till probably at 10 o'clock East Coast time. And then I got back to this. And I started digging in and one thing became uh, very clear uh, with this alert is that there was some kind of fraud. You know, a card I hadn't used, et cetera. And I'm like, okay, this is pretty bad. So like all of us would do, I started investigating a little bit. Now. Just to let you know some of the tools that I had at hand. So uh, I utilize Security Onion at home. Highly recommend that you do. It's phenomenal. Uh, it's a great place to train because it's a network that you presumably know. Um, we utilize OpenDNS. I've got you know, standard Ubiquity stuff kind of deployed because I got lazy after a period of time and it works really well. Uh, Google Family Link. We've got credit card notifications. We've got some identity lock stuff. Um, as well as given our background, some periodic social media review, I've got some specific blocks, I've got some monitoring that comes from the school. So, not bad. Um, so there's kind of the, the, the basic skill set and what I'm starting to work with. So this came through, specific threat, and then I'm like, okay, and I expected it was just kind of, you know, regular potential malicious fraud, but it was a fairly decent charge on, again, something that we don't use. So when I started digging in, popped up Security Onion, went looking for that particular vendor just to see if there was something going on, and sure enough, it pops up, and I'm like, oh, yeah, here's, here's DNS query, here's HTTPS out to this particular vendor, and it's like, oh, which device is it coming from? And it's coming from my daughter's phone. I was like, oh, well, that's challenging. So what would be my first thought? Now I have to have a conversation with her. But because this is what we do for a living, and I kind of feel bad for her in some ways, this is what I do. I can't leave myself there, so I do five minutes before and five minutes after. So, and I start finding other stuff. Now, already no sleep, already kind of frazzled, already kind of fried. I dig in and do what I assume a lot of us would probably do, is I dig in like I'm going to work. So, down the rabbit hole. So, and I start digging for a substantial amount of time. And this is what I find. So, what she had access to, and getting a cell phone at 12 was a hard one fight, and it was lots of no social media. I thought it was really interesting that I had called out that TikTok was probably the most insidious tool you've got, because I agree. Uh, one of the painful things that Naya was subjected to was I made her initially read the EULA for TikTok, which tells you basically you're getting screwed by these people because all of your data belongs to them in perpetuity. And she understood it intellectually, but still, come on, everybody's got TikTok. So what she had permission to use was, you know, basic Android phone. She had a Gmail account for school and a Gmail account for home with strict instructions that you don't have social media, you don't have all of these other things. So what she had done in a short period of time, and this is about a 72 hour period of time overall, is she had set up multiple sock puppet Gmail accounts. Um, where she failed, and she's gonna listen to this eventually, is she nested them all. So different passwords for all of them, but they were all nested and I could see looking up the logs, all of the, how do you set up Gmail without a, a phone? 
And she followed down, and it was fascinating because she's back and forth trying to figure out how to get past these things. So on one level, I'm just like, wow, that's really good. And on another level, I'm son of a bitch. <laughs> so she had set up all these nested accounts, and she was using those accounts to then register for other things. So in the space of about 72 hours, she not only had set up uh, TikTok, she had gotten into some pretty scary areas of YouTube. She had done this Etsy order. She had done an order off of Ooze, which is a vape site. Um, she had gotten out on Instagram and connected with lots of her friends. She had gotten out on Snapchat and created multiple Snapchat accounts that she was using to triangulate different pieces. She had gotten into some of these scarier areas of Discord, and this is where things get a little icky. So some very scary areas of Discord. Um, and some other sites that I'm not going to mention here, but the kind of thing that as a, as a parent, you're like, what the hell? <sighs> okay. So I had a pretty good idea of where some of these were. She also, and the reason I've separated these, she also had tried to set up PayPal, and they had eventually shut her down. She had tried to apply for a credit card on Capital One, and they eventually shut her down. She had set up Lyft and Uber accounts, which she couldn't fully set up because she didn't have a credit card. But she got way closer than she should have for a 14-year-old that doesn't understand how some of these things work. Now, what she had done, which was great, was she was constantly looking. So she'd run into a block, and she'd go and look stuff up and find things, and then dig deeper and dig deeper and dig deeper. But by this point, I'm far down the rabbit hole. It's about 4 o'clock in the morning. I am freaking out. And what I'm doing, how I'm proceeding, is investigating like you would if you were trying to prepare a case to go present to somebody. I'm doing screen captures, I'm capturing stuff, and I'm trying to clean some of these things up. So I start reaching out to abuse at some of these sites like, hey, this is a 14-year-old kid. You need to take this information down. And some of them, I got a really great email from one that was basically like, F you. So, um, so overall, though, where do you think my head was? All I wanted to do was just, I wanted to beat the hell out of the phone. I wanted to destroy every piece of technology. I was honestly embarrassed and ashamed that she had circumvented all of this stuff. And I was angry and terrified. It's interesting in that the, the, when you get into that state, the part of your brain that's actually working and you think that you're thinking, but you're really not thinking, you're reacting, especially with trauma response. So the cortisol, the adrenaline, all of that is what's feeding me at this point. And I was livid and shaking and didn't know what to do. And of course, it's in the middle of the morning, right? Um, so I sat there in my office, and I was just overwhelmed. And, and I'm like, I, I, I don't know what to do, and I don't know where to go. And I rely on my team quite a bit most of the time. Um, Paul mentioned in his talk, you know, like your, your professional network's not. But I'm like, I can't go to people with this. I can't go out to my friends. I can't go out to my colleagues. It's like, I don't know who to call. I don't know what to do. I'm far down this rabbit hole. I've got threat actors identified. I've got adults that are talking to a kid. All of this stuff, and, but I'm not thinking at this point. And I sat there, and I've got a sign above my desk that says, everybody you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind. And I sat back and I realized that my enemy here, my opposition, was not my daughter. As angry as I was, as disappointed, as terrified as I was, as much fear that I had, all of that energy that I was putting out potentially towards her, that stack of papers that I had, the notes, the, the, the screenshots, all of this to prove to her you've done wrong, and I realized that if my headspace is here, where the hell must hers be? What, what is the reaction of, of a kid in a Discord room where they're hitting you with rice purity tests and all sorts of nastiness and terribleness? And I realized that my approach to this and the training that I've had and the way that I approach these things professionally might be wrong because I'm reacting. I'm not thinking. And I'm not thinking about the people involved. I'm thinking about the technology. So I sat back and, and, and had a couple of minutes and still was really, really scared. 
on a lot of levels. And one of the things that I kind of lean back on and we talk a lot about in team building and working is creating spaces uh, that are psychologically safe. Anybody familiar with the concept, psychological safety? So the idea is basically you create a space where, you know, the, you, you'll hear the phrase, hey, there are no dumb questions. So kind of back to the point of we try to create spaces where it's okay to not know the answer. It's okay to say, what's that acronym? It's okay to say, I don't know, but I can find out. It's okay to say, hey, I got a crazy idea. Can we dig into this? Sometimes it's a little slower and it's a little bit challenging, but especially working with stronger, efficient, diverse teams, it's almost necessary, you know, it's the first thing that you've got to do is build that psychological safety. And what I had done and what unintentionally had done and what I was driving towards here was not that. What I was building was a highly adversarial environment which was not great. So thinking about safety, and, and unfortunately, you know, look, especially dealing with kids, we have to have conversations about safety and security that are new and challenging. You know, we started out very young with the, the when you see a dog, as much as you want to pet it, what do you do? Right? Ask permission, you know? It's like, that's pretty basic. We had to have conversations around safe and unsafe behavior in adults. You know, not an evolution of stranger danger, but really it's just like, hey, you know what? Some adults, some adults are responsible, some adults are not. So we had to have conversations around hide, run, fight. If you had told me when I was 16 years old that I'd be having a conversation with my kids about good cover in schools and how to identify adults that are reacting and collapsing, so we have those conversations. We have lots of those conversations. And, and unfortunately, it's a much scarier world than I think it really should be or it needs to be. We'll get to that. But one of the things I realized in this process was not only am I pumping all this cortisol and, and adrenaline to my head, but what happens when you do an investigation? What happens when you drive down that rabbit hole? Why is it that we, we get fed into that? There's a dopamine response that happens. We're finding something unique and creative and new, which drives us, but that, that questing, that's why so many video games and are popular that way, is that it drives us. You know, it's great. We all get that rush. So the same rush that I'm experiencing trying to investigate, she's experiencing as she's drilling into all of those things. So as she's exploring, doing YouTube, digging into these spots, so she's getting that rush and that reinforcement albeit in some very negative ways. But reinforcement sometimes is the end game, and it doesn't matter where you get it from. So drilling into those points and, and um, understanding that we're not using our higher brain function. We're not really thinking at that point. We're reacting, especially when we talk about PTSD and trauma. I was stuck in that cycle. And I think she was as well. So having an understanding of, hey, this is how I have to approach this in the morning, is to have a conversation. And it's like, hey, where's your head at? You know, not what did you do, but hey, are you OK? So in opening that space, which again, professionally, is not the way that we typically approach things. So Thinking about that, that rush, thinking about that engagement, and then one of the things that I've been kind of on about for quite a while is social media is pretty much proven, I think, at this point to be harmful, especially to adolescent women, uh, targeting adolescent women um, in some pretty profound and horrible ways. So we know that it's toxic. We know that, that this is, but we continue to allow these things to exist, and I mean, they do, and they're multi-billion dollar businesses, so it makes a little bit of sense. But living in the world that we do, how do you protect your kid when this is where all the kids are? You know, how do you, how do you create a space where they're targeted, not targeted by this, and with the algorithms, and this is, this is work that we do. So understanding that even if she intellectually understands that this is bad for you, She's still going to do it because everybody else is doing it. And it's not a peer pressure thing. It is, this is what it's designed to do. It's designed to keep you engaged. It's designed to get you to drive and drive at those things. And 
targeted directly at that age group. So we ended up sitting down and having a conversation. And this is an ongoing conversation, and I'll be honest. Uh, this has been since this time last year, or since December of last year. And there are good days and bad days. Uh, there's still a pressure of, hey, I want to be on Snapchat because that's where my friends are. And it's like, no. But understanding that no and just taking the device away or eliminating the device does not actually fit with that ethos and does not prepare her properly. So we have to have those conversations. And sometimes it's a lot of repetition in driving some of that awareness. You know, talking about how influencers work. You know, and the fact that, you know, hey, they're talking about this great product that they love, but they're getting compensated for it, and it's just another form of advertising. So appealing to the intellect, but also understanding that, hey, this is somebody that's navigating and trying to carve their space in the world. So one of the things that we did is I sat down with her, and I asked her, I'm like, what are you worried about? You know, what are the things that are in your mind? And, and this is directly from her, and, and I think she captured it pretty well. Um, and again, 14-year-old, uh, worry about life and future, body and how I look, intelligence, worry about my grades, mental health, parents, money, death, getting jumped, worry about going to school, worry about her sexuality, worry about myself. That's a lot. If you ask most CISOs, it's like, hey, what are the, the things that you're most concerned about in the next 18 months? You're going to get a much shorter list and a much easier list to combat. And I asked her, what does security mean to you? What does safety mean to you? And she came back with this. Comfortable in your own space, able to let yourself go in your space. Now, security professional, I'm like, you know what? This, this to me, really kind of put me back on my heels. Because I'm like, I'm like, do we build systems for this? Have I, as a parent, done this? Has I, as a professional, done this where people are free to do the stuff that they need to do and feel secure and safe? So, so kind of next steps. It's an ongoing conversation. Like I said, there are good days and bad days. We've had a couple of stumbles in different points. Uh, because this is recorded and publicly available, I'm not going to tell you about some of the deeper and some of the follow-up stuff. I ended up with lots of, what the hell do I do with this? You know, I am not under-resourced. It's not like I don't know folks. Um, I'm really interested to hear Mark's talk because I'd like to figure out, like, like, find out how he investigated and what he was able to do. But there was a lot of this where I'm like, I'm talking to vendors that could care less, that did nothing to, to protect uh, keeping a kid out of their systems. Um, and I kind of took away and came away with a bunch of things. One, having the conversation, having committing to that conversation and understanding it's not as simple as, here's a phishing campaign, or hey, I told you that TikTok was bad, don't use TikTok. Having that conversation back and forth Again, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but it's totally worth it um, and ongoing. And I think the only r rational way to approach something that changes almost every day. Um, I think our understanding and what we talk about as threats, and I know this may be challenging, our understanding of threats is not just APT, is not just bad actors. I think there are some things that we have created that are existential threats to our existence. Um, I don't mean to trash anybody or come down on anybody that works for any of these orgs, but I think as professionals that live and work in security and safety and understand threats and see the impact that that has on real human beings, I think we maybe need to hold our employers and vendors that we work with, developers of these things, to higher standards. You know, all about making money, but not off the backs of exploiting people. And there's, in my mind, very little difference between some of the exploitation that we see built in by algorithm and actual exploitation and trafficking. So I think that as we do that, we need to build into some of that technology, understanding uh, ways that we can develop empathy, transparency, and communication in that tech. Um, I've been looking for technology that gives me the opportunity to do responsible monitoring without having to see all of the icky, icky stuff. Don't get me wrong, I don't shy away from icky. I don't recommend that you do. Conversations that are uncomfortable I think are necessary, uh, especially as parents. If you can't have those conversations, the really complex stuff, 
it's really hard to have a conversation, so you've got to embrace it and dive in. But it'd be great if there was software, if there was tech that allowed us to do some of the things that we need to do without me having to dive into the really nasty stuff. Um, I think we need to go beyond awareness. I think we've been doing the same kind of security awareness training for years. Um, I think most of us probably have to do it as part of our work. How many people go through it 2x and click through it and don't really pay attention to it? It's not awareness training. It's the same kind of thing I used to teach uh, self-defense for people. And it was always the, hey, I want to do a Saturday seminar. And so, like, great, you're going to retain almost nothing. I can teach you some techniques. But really, this has to be changing your life. Situational awareness takes a while to develop. Response takes a while to develop. So that training that we need to develop, where we say everybody's security is everybody's job, needs to evolve. So, and I think we need to build community beyond our boundaries. I think a lot of these conversations, and I, I love security conferences, but taking those outside into other areas. Talking about this at our experience level, I've been to an a, a, a education conference with teachers, and the existential threat for them is vaping. And it's like, understand that's a problem, but there's so much more. So it's great that we talk to each other, but I think we need to do a better job of expanding that community. And then I guess the last thing here, the next steps, is I'm looking for help. So I'd like to get some feedback. I love feedback not only in the talk, but on response, on how to do some of this better. I've got some ideas. I might, uh, like Paul had mentioned, it's like, you know, I have, I have my toolbox of things. So if the world comes down to my abilities scripting, things have gone drastically wrong. Um, so I can't go out and build the software, but I have some ideas on how to do some stuff. But I'd love to hear other ideas, and if you know of some things, let me know. But the other big piece is um, this shameless plug. Um, I come back to the conversation piece and making it and normalizing it OK to ask for help. Part of what I realized my problem here was had it been in the middle of the afternoon and I had my people around me, that would have been my first call if it hadn't been a really horrible day. Um, that would have been my first call, and I probably would have gotten to better solutions faster, and I probably would not have ended up down that rabbit hole and in a really rough place that I've been digging myself back out of. So not only, um, and feel free to hit the QR code, shameless plug your swag, I've got some stickers over here as well, but asking for help here, tremendously important. So I've talked to mental health folks about this. I've talked to educators about this, school counselors, tech folks, et cetera. And that's made this burden a lot easier. So one more thing, just in the naming of things, I'm just going to throw this in here. Because how we talk about things matters. You know, And I use this phrase in talking to my daughter about a zero trust environment. And her reaction, anybody want to guess what her reaction might have been hearing zero trust? <laughs> what, was the, what was the thing that she said? You don't trust me. And I'm like, son of a bitch. We talk about it. And I'm like, what does this mean to the people, the users that we are, are, are protecting, supposedly? It's like, it makes sense to us. But in communicating to them, it's like, oh, we've got a zero trust initiative. And it's like, well, wait a minute. We're on opposite sides of that. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe we can name it something better, because I think it's a horrible mindset thing still. And that's it. Questions? Yeah, yeah, just in, just in the naming. So, thank you. Questions? Thanks. I, I do have a couple of giveaways. Uh, 